Whoa. How you all doing? I, I, I'm going to tell you, I am surprised at the number of people here because it seems like every hour I get a call, a prayer request from someone that they know someone that's got COVID or they've got COVID and they're quarantining. And I thought, we're pretty much on lockdown, <laughs> even if we're not on lockdown because everybody's quarantined. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for being here, people watching online. I hope that those people who are quarantining are watching and then we've got a group of people who are camping today. So we'll just pray for safety for them. So let's stand. We'll, we'll uh, have a word of prayer and get right into the service. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your holy presence with us this morning. Father, we thank you for this day that you have set aside for us to come and worship you, to call upon your name, Father. Open up our hearts, open up our ears, open up our minds and our spirit to the truth that you have for us today. Father, put a joy in our hearts and a song on our lips as we come to worship you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Lakeway. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Good. Um, well, I just wanted to open it up this morning with just a quick scripture. Um, why do we worship God? For so many reasons, right? But one of the reasons is because of his goodness. And Ezra 3.11 says, and they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. starting again.
super secret code. Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name? Would care to fill my heart? Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. He is our good, good father.
It's who I am. It's who I am. God, well, thank you so much for being present with us this morning. We need to hear your voice, and we need your presence in this time. We are all in the, have just been in this quarantine, isolation, loss of community, and God, we need your goodness this morning, and we need your love. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you, band. Good morning again, everybody. Hey, if you are online, I have a challenge for you this morning. And uh, we're getting more and more people online because uh, of the situation that we're in. So if you're online, we have a little contest here. Who's the furthest away? Who's the closest? Who's the warmest? And who's the coldest? So say hi, pay attention, but be thinking about those things. We had snow here last week. Wasn't that awesome? I mean, we didn't settle or anything, but we had snow. Kids were so excited. I was so excited. Love to see the snow. We are in a series called My God Is, and you get to fill in the blank. My God Is. And each week, uh, we're going to look at a different aspect of the nature of God. Now, here's why we're doing this. Having a right understanding, a right perspective of who God is, is essential for life. Because how you view God dictates how you live your life. So this is very, very important. You ever heard the saying, perception is everything? Well, if your perception of God is wrong, then pretty much everything in your life is going to be wrong. Perception, right or wrong, is everything. Let me show you what I mean. There's a a, a violinist called Joshua Bell. Anybody ever heard of Joshua Bell? Yeah, we're not very cultural, are we? But there's a violinist called Joshua Bell, and I hadn't heard of him Uh, prior to to, to this either. And he's a really good violinist. He began playing at age four. By the time he was 17, he was playing in Carnegie Hall. Um, He's played at the White House. He's played at all kinds of fancy opera houses and fancy concert places all, all over the world. So needless to say, he is an accomplished violinist. Well, back in 2007, a newspaper columnist decided to perform an experiment. And he, he had Bell dress up as a busker put on a baseball cap, and he went into the uh, subway in Washington, D.C., and had a couple of speakers, had his his violin out. There should be a slide for this. We're having issues. All right. So they put a little collection bucket out in front of him and had hidden cameras around so they they could film it, and he played for 45 minutes in the subway. Around 1,100 people passed him by in that 45 minutes. Now, he played top-quality concert pieces. He wasn't there playing no happy birthday to you. He was playing good stuff. One of the pieces that he played is actually considered to be one of the most difficult violin pieces that that you can play. So they're they're going through the subway, and you've got this world-class violinist playing world-class concert music with his baseball cap on, a couple of speakers, and a little bucket out in front of him. So how did people respond? Well, in the 45 minutes, 1,100 people passed him by, seven stopped to listen. Of 1,100 people, seven stopped to listen. One actually recognized him. So that was kind of interesting. 27 people dropped money in the bucket. In the 45 minutes, he collected $32.17, not including a $20 bill dropped in by the person who recognized him. Now, here's the weird thing. Three days prior to this experiment, he played the exact same pieces of music in a concert hall in Boston that was completely sold out. Average price of tickets, this is back in 2007, was $100. So it would be like $150, $200 today. What was the difference? Perception. The people in the subway weren't really listening to the quality of the music, right? They're on their way to work. They see buskers every day. They just, this guy's out of work. Get a job, buddy. You know, what, what do you want my money for? They didn't stop to listen because buskers are a dime a dozen. And I wonder if, if someone had stopped one of those people 
and pointed to him over there with his baseball cap on and said, how much would you pay to see this guy play in a concert hall? They probably say, oh, I wouldn't pay to see him in a concert hall. He's in the subway here. And yet two days prior, you couldn't get a seat. There were no seats available. It was $100 a ticket. The place was sold out. The difference? Perception. The people in the subway didn't see him for the incredible talent that he is, and they responded accordingly to him. He's just a busker. The people in the concert hall, they knew, man, this is world-class violinist. I'm, I get to be, can't get anybody in here. It's packed. Perception is everything. It can be exactly the same way with our spiritual life. Those people in the subway missed out on something wonderful because of their preconceived perception. If our perception of God is wrong, we can miss out on something wonderful. Now, last week, we kind of kicked this series off, and we talked about how big is your God. Remember that? And we looked at a passage in the Old Testament where um, Moses had gone up on the mountain, and the Israelites, who knew God, had seen all of God's miracles, 10 minutes later, they're a little scared. They're making a, a, a golden calf to worship. And I spoke about how we do the same thing sometimes when it comes to being faithful with our time, our talents, our money. Suddenly our God's not so big and the golden calf gets bigger. And you can go online, Lakeway Online and, or YouTube, Facebook, and, and watch that message. This morning we're going to come at God from a different perspective. Today, my God is good. My God is good. Now the word good has a lot of connotations. It's weird, you know. You don't think about things, and I sit down to do this, and I think, okay, well, there's, he's a good person, right, as opposed to a bad person. How are you feeling? Good. This apple's good. Good grief. Ah, just good grief. That's such a weird one. I've never thought about it before. But there, there, there's all kinds of different perceptions of the word good. The one that I want us to look at this morning is the most basic idea of the word good. It's the simplest form of it. My God is good. I got a good God. Do you have a good God? I have a good God. Now, here's, here's why this is kind of a good starting point for this series. After we've looked at how big is our God, because all of the other attributes, all of the other characteristics of God, His righteousness, His holiness, His sovereignty, His justice, all of that stuff flows out of His goodness. If God's not good, we're in trouble. God has to be good. God has to be 100% good. And all of that other stuff comes out of His goodness. God's goodness is at the core of whatever your blank is. My God is. Whatever you might fill in there, His goodness is at the core of that. Now, there's a great passage of Scripture. It kind of follows on from the one last week that talks about the goodness of God. It's Exodus 33 and 34. Now, we're going to get into some, I need you to pay attention today because we're going to look at some difficult scriptures. And let me just preface it with this. Whenever you look at God, you've got to look at the whole picture. Sometimes we like to cherry pick God. You know, we want this attribute, we want that attribute, but I don't like this one and I don't like that one, so that's not my God. Well, our God is all of those things, and, and we're going to kind of look at some difficult aspects today as we look at God's goodness. Psalm 103.7. So this passage of Scripture is all about Moses and God. Psalm 103.7 talks about God's relationship with Moses. It says, he made his ways, he made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. Now, what's the difference between his ways and his deeds? Well, the people of Israel they saw all the good things of God. They saw him part the sea. They saw him lead him with the smoke and the fire. They saw manna falling from the sky. They saw all the good things. And sometimes we want to slot machine God, don't we? It's like, hey, God, can you send me this? Hey, God, can you send me that? Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Yeah, God's good. Sometimes that's the way we are. But the difference between the ways and the deeds, Moses knew God's ways. It's deeper. 
It's not sufficient enough just to know God's work. The relationship has to be deeper than that. Moses had a relationship with God, a special relationship with God. And it wasn't just, for Moses, it it wasn't just simply about what God can do for me. So many people have that kind of relationship. What, what, What can you do for me, God? I don't do anything for you, but what can you do for me? Moses wanted to know God. So Exodus 33, starting in verse 13. And this is Moses talking to God. He says, if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Teach me your ways. When you know somebody's way, there is an intimacy in the relationship. I know, I know my wife's ways. I know what she thinks. I know why she thinks it. I know what she feels. I know why she feels it. She knows how I think, why I think that way, how I feel. Why I feel that way? Because we know each other. We know each other's ways. There was a song years ago. Who was it? She's got a way about her. Anybody remember that? Anybody old enough? I can't even remember who sang it. Billy Joel? Billy Joel, yeah. When you know somebody's ways, you've got an intimate relationship with them. You know the heart. You don't just know the head. You know the heart behind it. Well, Moses and And God had that kind of relationship. So he says, if you're pleased with me, teach me your ways. I want to know more about you, God, so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. What he means by that is, don't worry about it. Rest at ease. I'm with you. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, Do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. Now, Moses is using his special relationship with God here to speak on behalf of the people. Uh, it, it's, he's reminding God that they've just done the golden calf thing, and God's not very pleased with them. And, and Moses is reminding them, these are your people, God. If you're not with us, if you don't go with us, what's the difference between us and, and anybody? We're your people, God. And God didn't need to be reminded of those things, but there's a lesson here in Scripture. That's why this is in Scripture. Never stop calling on the name of God for those who are far from Him. The people were far from God. And Moses is is actually trying to incite God's favor. Can you do this one for me, God? These These are your people, God. Just do this one for me. It's an important lesson. You know, never stop praying for people who are far from God. And I even say to people, sometimes people will come to me, they've had loved ones who have passed on and they don't know the relationship that they've got with the Lord. And I always say, make sure your relationship is right with the Lord so that when you get there to go to Jesus, you can go up to him and say, hey, remember Frank? He was my husband. I prayed for him for 30 years, and I'm not sure where he was. You remember, Frank? Would you do this one for me, Jesus? I don't know if he will, but it's worth a shot, isn't it? (laughs) I'm calling on you, God. I'm calling a favor. And then right at the end, Moses tags this little thing on. Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. So Moses wants to see God's glory. Just a few weeks ago, we're reading the account of the shepherds. Do you remember when the angel appeared and it said the glory of the Lord shone around? How did they respond? They were scared to death. And that was secondhand glory. That wasn't God. That was an angel. So Moses doesn't really know what he's asking for here. God, show me your glory. And what does God respond to him? He says, I will let my goodness pass in front of you. He could have said, I will let my might, I will let my strength, I will let my power, I will let my awesomeness. Or he could have gone, my love, my grace, my mercy. He doesn't. He said, I will let my goodness pass in front of you. And what he's teaching Moses here is, the very essence of who I am, Moses, is my goodness. 
And if you experience my goodness, all of those other things flow out of it. And then in the scripture, he goes on now to explain to Moses, you can't look at me anyway, because if you do, you'll die. And he adds this little passage right on the end here of this. And here's where you get the whole picture of God. He says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now, isn't that odd? I'm merciful. I'm good. Oh, and one of the stumbling blocks for for a lot of people is is sometimes, and I've had conversations like this with seekers and with people who are just anti-God, they read about passages of Scripture in the Old Testament, and they say, well, your, your God is arbitrary and cold. He does some mean things sometimes. And this kind of scripture would reinforce that. Why would God add that sentence to this statement about his goodness? It's kind of like saying, you're really pretty for a fat girl. (laughs) You're in pretty good shape for someone in your condition. I mean, you you got the one and then you got this other thing tagged on. It's like, why? (laughs) Why, God? Now, this is absolutely appropriate here. Like I said, you cannot take part of God without taking all of God. Otherwise, you've got a false God. You've got an idol. And what Moses is teaching, what God is teaching Moses here, that even in his lordship, his sovereignty, it flows from his goodness. God is sovereign, but his sovereignty is displayed in his goodness. Goodness. This is one of the most difficult aspects of God's character for us to get our heads on. This is not an arbitrary statement. God's not saying, which is what it seems like, well, I'm just going to toss a coin. If it turns out well for you, I bless you. I'll be compassionate on you. And if it's tails, <laughs> too bad. But that's not what God is saying. What he's saying is, out of my goodness, I will show mercy. Out of my goodness, I will show compassion. I'm not going to do it out of my anger. I'm not going to do it out of my justice even. I'm not going to do it as judge. I am going to show mercy and compassion onto whoever I want to out of my goodness. We we don't always get God. Even as I was preparing this, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm going to teach about the goodness of God, and these things are going through my mind, and and I'm praying, God, There are so many passages of Scripture where this is so hard. We're not always going to get it, and we're not always going to agree with it. But God's mercy and God's compassion flow from His goodness, and that's a trust issue on our part. When God does things or allows things that we don't understand, that doesn't mean that God is not good. It simply means that we don't get it. Now, if you think that was kind of, it gets tougher in the next little bit of Scripture. So if you've got your Bible, flip over to chapter 34 here. Now, this is when God passes Moses. We're starting to, just going to do two verses, verses 6 and 7. It says, and he passed in front of Moses. So he's told him, you can't look at me. I'm going to put you on a rock. I'm going to put my hand over you. I'm going to go past you. Let my goodness go past you. You can kind of see my back. That's all you're getting. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. What a wonderful passage of Scripture. These are God's words, right? He's describing Himself. Now, when you think of that statement, my God is, look at the adjectives here. We already had mercy and compassion. Now to that, we add gracious, faithful, forgiving, slow to anger. These are the attributes of our good God, abounding in love and faithfulness, abounding, overflowing, filled to the top, and it's coming out the sides, maintaining love to thousands. What do you do when you maintain something? You keep it working, right? You do the work that needs to be done to keep it working properly. God is maintaining love. You ever think about that? 
He's doing what needs to be done to keep our relationship with him. When we're messing it up and doing everything wrong, God's up there fixing it. I'm going to keep this thing going. I'm going to keep this thing going. I love you. You're an idiot, but I love you. And he keeps it going. He maintains his love to thousands. He goes out of his way to generously pour out of his out his love, his faithfulness, his mercy, his compassion, and his grace. God is good. Forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Now, I love this. Look at these words. How God has broken it. It's like the Lord is making a huge emphasis to cover all the bases. Like, whatever you want to call your badness, maybe you look at it as kind of bad. Maybe you look at it as totally evil. Maybe you look at it as this or whatever. Forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Call it what you like. I'm willing to forgive it. No matter how bad you might think it is or no matter how bad you think they might be, I'm willing to forgive it. And then we have the add-on. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now, wouldn't it be nice if the Scripture stopped at the first bit and the second bit wasn't on there? Anybody ever read this and kind of wondered, what? Really, God? To the third and fourth generation? This is in the same passage of Scripture where you're telling us that you're a good, loving, generous, caring God. Oh, and I'm going to punish you, your kids, your kids' kids, and their kids. How does that fit together? This, this makes no sense. So what's going on in here? Why three or four generations? Because it doesn't seem fair, right? Why would you punish innocent people for the sins of somebody else. I mean, let's just be honest. It's, that's what we're thinking, right? And, and if we want to get to terms with God, we've got to get to terms with God as He reveals Himself to us. And if God didn't want us to know this part of His character, it wouldn't be in there. So it's in there for a reason. So you kind of got to wrestle with Scripture sometimes. God doesn't punish innocent people. He corrects. He uses punishment as a correction. Now, let me explain. Typically, in a household, you'd have three or four generations living together. You've got dad, mom, next generation, their kids, and their kids. So, typically, it goes down to the great-grandkids. And in those days, they would all have been under the same household as they are in many places in the world now. Now, in our culture... Typically four generations, sometimes you get five, but for most families, four is about what you get, right? Time great, great grandkids come along, I'll be gone. They'll have to tell them about me if they remember me. And we don't all live together, but these people live together. Now, here's what's going on. In the chapter right before this, the Israelites have been unfaithful. They've made a golden calf. That's right before this chapter. They collected the gold, if you remember from last week, from their wives and from the children. So everybody in the house becomes complicit to this unfaithfulness. They collected the gold to make the golden calf from everybody in the household. That would have included all the children, everyone. Now you might say, but well, it's still not fair because the children didn't have any choice. Well, maybe. However, we all know that behaviors are caught, not taught, right? I mean, you can say what you want to your kids. They're going to do what you do. You know, I, I remember my mom. She used to smoke like a chimney, as we say in England. You shouldn't smoke. She quit when we were young, but the, I, all, all my childhood years, I can remember going down the shops to get 10 cigarettes or five I don't know why she wouldn't buy a pack of 20. It seemed like every five minutes, go down the shop and get me five cigarettes. It would have been cheaper to buy 20, but there you go. Maybe she was always quitting. But she smoked. Told us not to smoke. Fortunately, she quit early and none of us smoked. But we all know that behaviors are caught, not taught. 
So you've got something going on with the Israelites here. They immediately turn to God, turn from God as soon as things get scary. This is in the household. Everybody's complicit with this. Even the kids, even though they might not be part of the decision-making process, they're part of the problem. And God says, I'm going to punish you, and I'm going to punish all the way down to the people at the end of the line in the household here. Why? Because God takes unfaithfulness and sin seriously, especially when it comes from His people. And He's going to do what He needs to do to flush it out, especially from His people. And this is still true. When God's people, us, you and I, when we are consistently unfaithful, God will seek to correct it. I hate to tell you that, but that's just a fact. God, if, if you're truly a follower of Christ and you're going a way that is contrary to the direction that Christ wants you to go, He will seek to correct it. And typically when He does it, it's not pretty. So the next time it comes around and you're thinking about that, you kind of, nah, not going down that road again. And, you know, without getting into details, I can think back on times in my life when I have gone in a direction that God didn't want me to go in. I knew I was going in a direction that God didn't want me to do. And it was bad, and I lived to regret it, and I lived to regret it hugely. And after the fact, when you look at the cost, I wasn't willing to pay that. I didn't want to pay that much for that. God corrects His children. Now, when you put the first part of the Scripture, all the good things with the second part of the Scripture, what the Lord is telling them is that, I'm not going to let your sin go unpunished. We don't get to brush it under the carpet and pretend that it didn't happen, but I'm not going to punish you forever. There's an end to this. That's why it says, maintaining love to thousands. I've, people come to me and I've, Pastor Mike, tell me about generational curse. And there's a passage of Scripture they point to and they say, you know, it says that God's going to punish the children and the children's children. And the ch and it's a passage in Exodus 20. And we're so selective with what we read because in that passage, God says, I will show love to thousands of generations of those who love me, but will punish the fathers, the children, and the children's children and their children to those who hate me. Same thing, four generations. People pick up on the punish, four generations. Oh, God curses us. They miss out on, I will love a thousand generations. And what God is trying to explain here is, my love, I'll correct you. I will do what needs to be done, but I'm going to do it in my love. It's not going to last forever. And I love you. I'm your good God. Part of the research I'm doing for this series comes from a book by A.W. A. Tozer called The Knowledge of the Holy. And uh, this week I read a couple times a passage on God's goodness, and he ends the chapter with this. And it's a conundrum. He says, the greatness of God rouses fear within us, the awesomeness, the godness of God. But His goodness encourages us not to be afraid of Him, to fear and not be afraid. That is the paradox of faith. That's this tension that we live in. God is God. In a minute, He could make it that I never existed. I'm just wiping you out from everything, Mike. It'll be like you never, no one will remember you, no one will know that you were here. In a second, He could do that. Or I can bless you greatly. And guess what? I love you, and I'm going to bless you greatly. All right. Oh, I forgot my watch. Don't all start crying at once. All right, let's make this practical. How do we get to experience all the goodness of God? I got three steps for you. <laughs> That's not fair. Closest, Louis and Lan Nancy Lopez. <laughs> Furthest, Karen, Maria, and Sarah in the UK. BB's not watching? Philippines wins. 
Sorry, Maria, Karen, Sarah in the UK. Hot is Terry and Chuck in Florida. What's the temperature in the Philippines? Oh, it's winter down there. Yeah. Cold is <laughs> Kayla Simmons' parents. <laughs> Well, well, then why says, oh, oh, no, Van, Vince and Melinda Whiteman, 25 degrees in Illinois, yes. Runners up, the Thompsons, watching outside in 48 degrees with the Hicks and the Leals. Hello, Thompsons, Hicks and Leals, camping. Edmistons, David Christie, Broken Bow, Oklahoma. What is that? That's just a, a shout out. And Kayla's parents, Illinois, you're not by f anywhere near the farthest, but it's good. That's cool. Who is the closest? We are. <laughs> we are, right? We're the closest, right here. So how do we experience all of the goodness of God? Three steps for you, three quick steps, because I don't know what the time is. Number one, and they're almost the same steps as last week. Number one, repent. Number two, rest. Number three, risk. So let's break those down. Repent more specifically, repent of our ingratitude. That means, God, I am so sorry when I take your goodness for granted. And I complain and I whine. To repent means to change your mind, right? You're not a miserable God. You're not a God who's got it in for me. You're a God who loves me. Sorry when I miss your goodness. Romans 2, 4 says, Do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? This is the correctiveness of God. Number two, rest. More specifically, rest in His goodness when facing adversity. When things are going tough, you know God is good. When things are going good, you know God is good. When things are going really bad, you know God is good. And the best way to do this, I think, number one, is to remember Scripture. There's so many Scriptures that talk about God's goodness. i got a few. I'm just going to read them off real quick. Psalm 145, 9. The Lord is good to... Is it up there? The Lord is good to... All. Who's He good to? Everyone, the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all He has made. Psalm 100 verse 5, for the Lord is good and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Don't talk to me about generational curses. Talk to me about generational love and generational blessing because that's our God. Nahum 1.7, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in Him. James 1.17, every good and perfect good gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting sh shadows. Scripture is filled with encouraging passages of God's goodness. But for me, and I shared this with you last week, the best way to remember the goodness of God is your personal experiences of it. Write it down and remember it. I'm going to share. Sandra and I got a boatload. She's the one that writes it down, and, and sometimes I'll pick it up and read There's a boatload of God's goodness in our lives. Of things that some, I tell you, I kid you not, sometimes I just pray to God and I say, I don't understand why you are so gracious and so good to me. I feel like you favor me. I'm going to share a couple with you. Short, well, we'll see. One of the things I love about God is typically on a Sunday morning, when I come to preach something to you, He has worked it in my life that week. Like, it, it's fresh. I need to pray on how God blesses us with much riches. <laughs> and, and this morning was, was, was no different. So I'm sitting at the breakfast table. Actually, I got up really early and um, doing my devotion time, doing my prayer time, and I'm reading my notes for this. Now, this series, My God Is, is actually inspired by a series that I taught seven years ago called God As He Longs For You To See Him. 
That series was inspired by one of my favorite radio preachers, Chip Ingram from Living on the Edge Ministries. So as I was preparing today's message, I was looking back at my old notes, and I was looking at Chip Ingram's notes. And as I was looking at Chip Ingram's notes, he mentioned that book by A.W. Tozer, The Knowledge of the Holy, which I happened to have, so I pulled out The Knowledge of the Holy, and I read the chapter on the goodness of God. And as I was reading the chapter on the goodness of God, in that chapter, A.W. Tozer talks about, um, what's her name? Julian of Norwich, who was a nun in the year 1373, and she wrote a book called Revelations of Divine Love. Modern world, I just went on Amazon and I downloaded that book, and I read the chapter on goodness from that book. It was really weird because English in 1373 and English now, it was like reading a foreign language. So I've got my notes. I've got the notes from Chip Ingram. I've got the notes from A.W. Tozer, and I've got this stuff from Julian of Norwich. And I'm putting this stuff together, and I, and I, and I was praying. I just said, God, thank you. You know, there's that passage of Scripture that says we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And I was praying, God, I love all this stuff that you're giving me, all this information. I don't want to preach their stuff. I want to preach what you give me. But thank you for all of this stuff. There's always a risk when you, you share God's goodness in your experience that someone out there or here are going to think, yeah, just nuts. Maybe I am. But as I was praying this yes, yesterday morning, have you ever had that time when the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit comes on you at a whole different level? And as I was praying this, it was like the goodness of God just filled the room. And I was soaked in it. And I'm just praying. And I did what Moses did while I was praying. I thought, well, I got your attention, God. And I started praying through everybody that's got COVID and, and everybody I know who's lost somebody in the last year and just asking God to, to pour out his love. And his, I'm thinking, who else? Well, I got you here, God. And I'm praying through all of this stuff. And then Sandra came in. It was to have breakfast, so I stopped praying. And I got up and I went to the coffee maker. And as I was standing at the coffee maker, there was still that, that sense of, wow. And I thought, I just feel good. And I swear, I felt the Holy Spirit say, duh. <laughs> and then last night, I went to bed. And I don't know if this happens to you. And it was like all the worries in the world suddenly just came on me. Boom. And, and, I, and I beat myself. I'm like, why do you do this? You're just about to sleep, and now you decide to think about all of these things. And all of the concerns and all of the worries of the world just came upon me. And as I was lying there, I thought about the morning. I thought, gosh, just 12 hours ago, I was bathed in the goodness of God. And then I started to think about the goodness of God. And the next thing, it's the morning. And I apologize to God. I said, I'm lying here, Father, and I'm worried about all of these things. But you're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. But you've got to give thanks for the good, and you've got to give thanks for the difficult too. This week is uh, a significant week in our house. Three years ago this week, my son passed away. And, um, and I was thinking about him. And I remember back, we adopted James. And I remember the struggle we went through with infertility, and, and we saw God work in that. And, and through the adoption, it's, it's a big, long story, but it's filled with the intricacies of God's goodness. And I remember the day that we got James, and we met his mom. And as she gave him to us, she, she couldn't take care of him, but she didn't want an abortion. She wanted him to grow up in a good home, and she thought we would have a good home. And I remember her giving him to us. 
And she said, I hope he makes you happy. And he did. And then at about age 14, he was diagnosed with major de depressive disorder. And that really marred his life in, in many, many ways. And then three years ago, he took his own life. And you can come at that from all kinds of angles. Why did you take my son, God? How many times we pray for God's healing? I always thought that God was going to do something and it would just be a big part of James's story and he would be able to tell his story. Of, but that wasn't how the story went. And he passed away. But God gave us 30 years with James. And I'm thankful to a good God for those 30 years. I'm thankful for the memories of those 30 years. I'm thankful of all the families that God could have put James in. He put him in our family. And because he put him in our family, he knows Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And I know I will see James again. God is good when it's good. And God is good when it's tough. God is good good. Repenting is changing how you think about it. Resting in his goodness is just allowing God to just wash his goodness over you in the deep and dark times. And the last one, how do we respond? Risk stepping out in faith. You cannot fully experience God's goodness outside of his will for you. If you want to know the goodness of God, the full, full goodness of God, my God is good, risk stepping out in faith like you've never stepped out in faith before. And His goodness will flood into your life. It will surround your life. Just going back to James, I remember when he was 14. It was out of the blue. He had been a normal kid. He's 14 years old, and he tries to take his life. And we're like, what? But I remember both Sandra and I praying during that difficult, dark time, God, we're here to serve you. We're here to serve you in the good times. We're here to serve you in the, in the dark times. And as we go through this, God, strengthen us to continue to serve you. And he did. Risk stepping out in faith like never before. Build some bridges. This year is going to be all about bridges and connection. Now, that might be scary. But when you step out into the God, into the, in faith, you step into the God zone. And when you're in the God zone, you're in the best place that you can possibly be. Second Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life, life through our knowledge of Him who called us. I'm calling you. i got something for you to do. By His own glory and goodness. If you want to really experience God's goodness, step out of faith. Step out in faith. In His goodness, He has given you everything that you need to live a full life in faith with Him. He wants to bless you. He wants you to know His goodness. It's all on offer there. He loves you regardless. But when you step out in faith, when you move into the God zone, it's like, wow, God. You are good. You know, I think that most Christians fail to reap the, the full rewards of what God has for them because they're afraid to step out in faith. And they're more worried about what they have to lose than they are about what God has to give. And they're not really convinced of God's goodness. They think that if they step out in faith, God's going to send them off to Africa to some snake-infested village. My wife's fear was that he would send us to Winnipeg. <laughs> Sorry if there's anybody watching from Winnipeg, but you understand. <laughs> Here's the thing. Maybe he is going to send you there. But if God is really good, then that's the best place for you to be. And you should be there. Let me close with this. When the Lord comes to you and bids you follow Him, 
When he calls you to give up the things that you hold on so tightly to that you're afraid to give up. When he asks you to do things that scare you or that are inconvenient or might take you out of your comfort zone or you don't feel comfortable in doing that. I'm not gifted. When he calls you to do those things, remember the Lord calls out of his goodness. And he wants to bless you in it. We get to choose whether we respond or not. If we choose the affirmative, we discover something wonderful, God's goodness. Psalm 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in Him. Amen? I'm taking it. It's got to be sometime around 12. What time is it? 12 what? 12.03. We've got another 50 minutes. Awesome. All right. That's all I got for you this week. We're going to pray in a moment. Uh, we don't take up an offering. We don't hand an offering around. There's a little bucket there. If you please be faithful with your offering, you can give there. You can give online. Just go to our website, click give. You can mail your offering in. I've had people come in and slip it under the door. Be faithful and stay connected. Join me in the middle of the week. I do a midweek motivation. It's kind of toward the end of the week. It's third part of the week motivation. But it's just something to give a little boost in the middle of the week. So stay faithful. So what are your three points here today? Number one, repent. repent. Number two, rest. rest. Number three, risk. risk. I love it. You guys are good. Please stand. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. You are a good, good God. You're good to those people who are far away from here. You're good to those people who are right here. You're good to the people in the cold. You're good to the people in the warm. You're good to all people, good or bad, because, Father, none of us deserve your goodness. And all of your grace, all of your mercy, all of your love flow out of that goodness. Father, I pray for each and every one here and those watching online and those that will watch that they will humble themselves before you, that they will repent, that we will repent of our ingratitude. Father, open up our eyes to your goodness like they've never been opened before. Father, help us to remember the goodness and give us the courage to risk that we would experience your goodness as we act in faith. I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Father, pour your blessing out upon us so that we may go and be a blessing. In Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Thank you all for coming.